welcome to Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This conversation is a series called Art Insight and Community Building, presented by the Gloucester Cultural Initiative and co-sponsored by the Sawyer Free Library. Many thanks to Beth Pocock at the Library for supporting the artists on the panel today and the Gloucester Cultural Initiative for the opportunity to go live online. Gloucester Cultural Initiative's mission is to enhance the cultural vitality of Gloucester, which is a coastal city situated in an area of outstanding natural beauty in Massachusetts that more than 30,000 people call home. By serving the city, the people that live and work here, artists of all disciplines, cultural organizations and creative businesses, the Gloucester Cultural Initiative aims to foster connections, collaborations and ideas. This series was developed by Valerie Nelson as a way to bring arts, insight and community building together to inform, inspire and awaken the community on topics including climate change, housing and community just and food justice. I am Mary Jenkins and I'm very happy to be moderating this session today. I'm here with Les Bartlett and Susan Quaitman. Les Bartlett is a renowned photographer of quarry landscapes and he brings his love of Capan history to art and climate change. Susan Quaitman is an Anglo-American environmental planner and silk painter who lives and works on Cape Ann in Anasquam. Her passion for landscape preservation propelled her work, to her to work on art and climate change. Susan and, Le and Les have produced public art exhibits in Massachusetts and New Hampshire using silk paintings, photography, and easy to understand scientific text on the climate crisis. So here we are in the middle of a pandemic and you may have wondered why this session is being offered now. Everyone decided to go ahead because they think the pandemic and climate change are crises that have similarities. Like COVID-19, climate change is a worldwide issue and is impacting our lives that may be subtle for some, but devastating for others. And we're being, we are being told that changing our thinking and behavior is urgent. So why are artists involved in climate change? Over millennia, artists have responded again and again to historical and social events and circumstances. Artists today have become a mainstream voice with the power to lead discussion and play a universal role in climate conversations. If you like, they are the canaries in the coal mine. Artwork can often say what words cannot and pack an emotional punch for an audience that can lead to deeper interest. Well-regarded art critic Ben Davis believes that in a world where information fatigue has created an atmosphere where crucial information is constantly disregarded or distorted, artists are creating compelling and vivid projects that translate complex scientific findings to convey information. If you like, it's a way of setting people on a journey from knowing to caring which is the path to action and stewardship. Another strength of involving artists is that they are not constrained by standard scientific um, methods. They challenge things that tend to be taken for granted. This can lead to new ways of understanding and acting upon climate change. So if art can provide a means to visualize, express, and shape the kind of society we want to create, how effective is the art at getting the message across? And what is the role of art in communicating climate change? What we're exploring today is what's happening at the intersection of art and climate change. Hello, everyone. So here we are, Les, on the snowiest March day in 2015, when it snowed one foot every Wednesday in New England. We've trekked into Flat Ledge Quarry in Lockport where the water dripping down the quarry walls has turned into huge, enormous icicles. And where we decided to make a pop-up exhibit of my quarry silk paintings. And Rich, my husband, had to wear a hard hat because it was so dangerous with the icicles falling down. So these silk paintings of the quarry were a prelude to creating silk paintings about climate change. After a 15-year career as an environmental planner and then landscape designer, 
during the economic downturn of 2010, I decided to combine my passion for preserving beautiful landscapes as open space to painting landscapes on silk. And I present them as wearable pieces. And more importantly, I wanted to show the silks in the landscape. So one day, about seven years ago, I realized I didn't want to throw away all my training and planning and all my connections with environmental nonprofit organizations. And the climate crisis was gnawing at me. On a brilliantly sunny morning, I had an aha moment. I realized it was my life's work to combine silk painting with climate crisis issues. I wanted to wake people up to what was happening in their backyards. As we watched high tides washing over roads and we suffered from increasing rains and droughts, I wanted to use the emotional power of images on silk. As a community planner and activist, I asked how could art help provide a voice to change our direction? My focus became now to paint on silk coastal landscapes of the North Shore and Cape Ann and show how they were being affected by climate change. And Les, I've long admired your photography work and I'm so appreciative of your engagement and your passion about this topic. And I learned in turning my lens toward climate change that I needed to park my car in a different spot. We often start with climate issues at a very local level. And it's easy to park the car looking at the beautiful landscapes and the coast and sunsets. But this is definitely not a pretty image. Many of you will recognize Gloucester's bomb cycle of January 2018, which covered cars in the high school parking lot with six inches or more of frozen ice and snow. Here on coastal Cape Ann and the North Shore, we face soaring storm surges and flooding every time there's a nor'easter. Increasing level rise compounded by storms are ever-present shadows of our daily lives in Cape Ann. We call this image the tools of our trade. It shows a camera, paintbrushes and dies in the window of an abandoned house at Steel Derrick Quarry in Rockport. We use these tools as our painterly lenses to view and interpret the world. And our artistic collaboration has been in place for seven years. That's actually 14 years in total. And we bring totally different backgrounds, sensibilities and skills to the table. And somehow we're able to produce work on climate change that hits your heart. I come from London, the UK, via a small market town in Shropshire called Shrewsbury, which sits on the border with Wales. I was raised in London during the swinging 60s and then into the more austere Thatcherite 70s. And this number 11 bus was actually the bus that I took to school from World's End in Chelsea to Hammersmith. I was an environmentalist from the age of 18 and worked with Friends of the Earth and as a planning and community organizer for the Town and Country Planning Association in London. I came to the US in 1980 for a master's in city and regional planning at Cornell University. It certainly wasn't in the plan, but I ended up staying here. So my professional passion for landscapes began when I was hired to be director of the Mass Highways Department's open space program in the late 80s. I had a $10 million budget to acquire for conservation important scenic views from the highways. And this is the leaflet that we produced for the program. One of our biggest projects was with Ed Becker of the Greenbelt Association, where we protected the green corridor of Route 128 from Beverly to Gloucester. I became a silk painter in 2010, feeling horrible reverberations from our huge economic downturn just before. I started working with Kate Seidman, who started 10 pound studio at One Center Street in Gloucester. We've now been going for 10 years and have a strong group of wonderful silk artists. And since moving to Anisquam in Gloucester in 2018, I now have my own home studio, which you can see on the right, Cove Studio, where I paint on silk and I'm learning oil painting. 
On the left is a silk scarf inspired by walking along Cape Ann's wooded trails. I grew up many buses away from the background that Susan grew up in. I come from rural Epsom, New Hampshire. And you're looking at a hundred year old farmhouse where for 300 years, my parents and grandparents and great grandparents, the farm going. And every day as a child, I work with my father to milk the one cow over the dirt roads, past the elm trees, past the lawn swing, past the outbuildings. And even as a child, I knew that there was a tremendous effort that my dad and his brothers were doing to keep one cow alive as if it was a herd of cows. The fields were mowed, the hay was gathered, the water turned on and off in spring and fall. And beneath my feet, I felt the 300-year-old farm evaporating. Eventually, the elms died, the dirt was paved over. And even now, seven years later, I carry within me the sense of harm and the slice rhythm of its dignity and death. My adult career encompassed being a jester and juggler and performer for over 30 years at the Le Grand David Magic Company in Beverly, Massachusetts. In that time, I also juggled a career in publishing and graphic design. But it was at the stage of the Cabot Cinema that I learned the value of light as a sensed purpose, cast from within a staged space. That light within a stage space followed me into my career as a photographer photographing the large scale granite quarries of Cape Ann. And in October 2007, Chapters on a Quarry Wall opened in the Cape Ann Museum's third floor gallery. A four month installation attracted over 2,500 visitors, and I experienced enormous success. And this paved my way for more painterly photography, rock faces and boulders of Cape Ann and Vermont. Here at the Cape Ann Museum one day in 2007, Susan Quaitman walked in, walked around the works, signed the guest book and left. Another seven years would pass before we formally met. So when we finally met Les, I repeatedly asked you to photograph my work. And I repeatedly said, go away, I can't be bothered. And I said, but please, would you photograph my work, my silk work? And I repeatedly said, please go away. And over time, I realized that in that please go away, I was so full of myself, so flush with success, that I couldn't see anyone else's requests. So you decided finally to work with me? I did, I think. Yeah, and I think one of the things that changed, Susan, was realizing that you were really dedicated in your wish to become an artist. And so painting that I knew nothing about was your passion. And finally, finally, after maybe 400 times of your asking me, I said, <laughs> let's take a walk in the quarry. And finally, you did walk me into the quarries. And what we learned is that we like to walk slow. We walked slowly. We weren't on the phone. We weren't walking we walk, we walk maybe a tenth of a mile, maybe a quarter of a mile. And that turned into a great result. Yes, I took your photos into the studio and took and produced silk paintings of quarries. And in the course of this, once we traveled around through Cape Ann and Rockport a lot, we made a day trip to Barrie, Vermont to visit the quarries of Barrie. And it was in Barry that Susan took this photograph of me, and we each found a quote that was really emblematic of our approach to the art. And I found a quote by John Ruskin. John Ruskin says, the greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something and tell what it saw in a plain way. Hundreds of people can talk for one who can think, but thousands can think for one who can see. To see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. And Leslie took this photograph of me in the quarries of Barry, Vermont. And I was very moved by the quote of Isamu Noguchi, we are a landscape of all we have seen.
So we started off on this on the journey of art and science of climate change by working closely with staff at Mass Audubon and Essex County Greenbelt Association from 2013. We produced montages of silk paintings and photography of inundated iconic images, such as the Gloucester Fisherman's statue, which is shown on the left. On the right is Sir Arthur Fiedler, the beloved conductor of the BSO. There's a statue of position in the Charles River that Susan created this from. When we were going through the text and I added the word beloved for Arthur Fiedler yesterday, Susan told me the anecdote. This was put on, um, where was it? At, where was it was this? at Bedrock Gardens in Lee, New Hampshire. Oh, okay. So someone walked up and said, well, Arthur Fiedler wasn't beloved. He was a really tough, cantankerous kind of guy. And it, made, it gave me pause because I realized that with this issue of public art, um, this isn't art in a gallery. It's, it's art that's out there for people to take a look at and walk by. And even with this, this lady who said, well, Arthur Fiedler wasn't such a great person, she was interacting with the art. And that's an important aspect of what we're doing, is that it's art that's put out for an interaction with people in a specific location. So talking about art and the location, this is our exhibit on climate change in the Great Marsh, which was shown here in the Great Marsh at Essex County Greenbelt Association's Cox Reservation in Essex, Massachusetts. You know, I, I want to add, Susan, I'm realizing that, that it's important to bring out that with these pieces and with these projects, many times the pieces move from location to another. And that just as we're sharing our reflections and remembrances and stories, the pieces move and tell their own story. Yes, indeed, Les. The, the, the pieces were moved to the Crane Estate Art Show in Ipswich. Um, and the silk paintings were combined with photography to tell the stories. And that you can't, can hardly see it, but there's text as well, which was very kindly written by Robert Bax, Buxbaum at Mass Audubon. And again, we have a background of marsh and coastline of, from Ipswich. So, Silk paintings tell stories of climate change. These banners are hanging from Leslie's studio in Lanesville. They tell stories, stories of invasive kudzu from the south crowding out the native sumac, of storm surge knocking houses from their foundations, in this case in Cape Cod, and marshes becoming mud flats as a result of sea level rise. It was in this location where Susan repeatedly said, would you please work with me, would you please photograph my work, would you please walk into the quarries, this very spot that Susan is standing in. And it's important to point out that uh, we have none of this. Every single piece of artwork that we're showing you, almost without exception, we printed ourselves, which gave us great control from beginning to end of the project. Well, let's print it, let's be honest. Okay. <laughs> um, so we, we collaborated in creating this uh, poster for a big exhibit in 2016. Um, it was an exhibit on climate change and the National Park Service, a, which was also funded by the Park Service as part of their bicentennial celebration. It, it wasn't just that we got this project, and, and many of these projects we, we had to get wonderful foundations and grants to provide us the funds to do it. There is a point where passion takes over, but at the beginning, it's not all cut and dried. Susan didn't wake up and say A, B, C, D. She said, Les, I've got a hunch. I'm going to this meeting at Storm Surge and there's this man named Jonathan Parker talking from the National Park Service. And I got a hunch that there's a project that we can do. And I have learned to trust Susan's hunches. <laughs> this project in Salem at the Visitor Center ended up being 540 square feet of display space. And it was up from August to October of 2016. We realized in 2015 that the United States lagged far behind other European countries in artistic efforts around climate change. And so we took the phrase, climate change does not respect boundaries, which is at the bottom left of the graphic you're looking at. And we translated it into French, Spanish, and Polish and printed it and included it in the exhibit because there are many Hispanics, Haitian, and a large community in the history of Poles in Salem. We thought this was an important step. 
project had three components. The first panel on the left covered climate change in the Salem Maritime and National Historic Site. And with it, we put a stamp of collaboration on address the local issues, respect the current efforts and questions on climate change, and address it in a larger capacity. In this case, not only is climate change does not respect bounds, we're pointing out that it's man-made and according to the IPCC, we have a very short window of 10 years to lower our emissions and find new ways of existing on this planet. That was five years ago, so put one half with five fingers up, right? And with this panel, we introduced the science of sea level rise, which was affecting Salem shoreline, and the science of increasing precipitation, droughts, fires, and the differences between climate and weather. It's a mouthful, it's a lot. The space you're looking at was uh, about 12 feet across by 10 feet high. The middle panel, we addressed climate change in the National Park Service, where we addressed the national global issues around climate change and how they affected the national parks from Joshua Tree, Yellowstone, and to the Statue of Liberty. And here you're seeing a wonderful combination of photography and Susan's paintings collage to acquaint the severity and continue to present the science. With the third panel, we address the question of hope for the future. And certainly in the time of COVID-19, it's easy to say we're all in the same boat. We've chosen to cast a different boat on the water, a boat for children and for grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And with a boat to raise the question, what is going to be left after our talk today, after this day, after this community effort? Well, the boat was actually in the Salem Park and we managed to move it in front of the uh, panel. And as children came in, children gathered in the boat. Well, you're right, Les. I like, like playing hunches. Um, <laughs> and one of the hunches was after I went to a lecture um, by the Nature Conservancy on landscapes resilient to climate change. And I had a hunch that this was actually something that's, that was pertinent to the quarry landscapes. The lecture was conducted by Dr. Mark Anderson of the Nature Conservancy. And he said that a climate resilient landscape is one where the effects of climate change are actually buffered by natural properties of the landscape. The diverse topography, the diversity of species, the different microclimates and connected natural pathways allowing safe passage for animals. After all my walks through the quarries with Les, I asked the Nature Conservancy if Rockport and Gloucester's quarry landscapes were actually climate resilient landscapes. And they looked at the science and they looked at their maps and they said, they said yes. So Les and I decided to apply for grants to create a specific exhibit on this topic. And we got grants from Applied Materials, Essex County Ecology Center and the Greenbelt Association to create an outdoor exhibit of silk paintings and photography on climate change resilience. This was an exhibit for the Quarry Dance 5 at the Clemola Reservation. And it, Quarry Dance 5 was organized by Windhover Center for Performing Arts. Here we see a poster that we made in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy. So along the way, Susan's hunches started to become a matter of fact, conversations back and forth, text and emails, and I realized that I was waking up every day thinking about how we were gonna get to the next part of the project, even more so than where I was gonna to go to photograph a walk. So you see the title of the poster, The Resilient Quarry Landscape of Cape Ann. Something takes place at this moment with this man that really sinks into my muscles of the importance of art and climate change. So the poster's clear. It's graphically presented. We had the charts and graphs drawn up by the Nature Conservancy. This man lives down the road from where he is now. He's looking at a, the poster and he's saying, I live here. It's my neighborhood, but I don't know where I am at. And so I realized that there was a gap between science and art 
and understanding that part of the gap that we needed to cover was to provide a way, a simple way for the viewer to come in and to stand or to sit and understand what we were presenting. And so much of that was done at the Clamola and Resilient Landscape Project reflected this. This is one of Susan's extraordinary soap paintings of the Clamola quarry, where you can see the quarry to the left, the beautifully muted trees and shadows and her silk hanging from the copper rods that allowed it to move through the air. And it exemplifies that we often create landscape artworks exhibited in position and being able to move to different locations. On the left is that Clamola painting in a window at the Marblehead Art Association because the concept of the resilient landscape traveled from Rockport and Cape Ann to the Marblehead Art Association where we examined resilience in both Cape Ann and Marblehead. In Marblehead, we focused on community resilience. And we suggested that Marblehead as a town was much more resilient, able to recover from adverse situations as a result of their many open spaces. We imagine that this is even more the case now with COVID-19. And here we are in Wyman Woods in Marblehead which we walked through and Les took photographs. His photograph that we showed at the exhibit is shown on the upper left. And I brought this photo into 10 pound studio and created the silk painting on the lower left. We made a montage of the two, which you see on the right. This montage represented a breakthrough of, it wasn't just two artists bringing their own views, it was that the views merged into something entirely new. Susan was away, I think you were away at your daughter's graduation, right, at college? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I call her to say, Susan, people are walking into the gallery and they're walking up to the Wyman Woods collage and they're saying, wow, I don't know what this is, something new, it's something different. Um, it just hits me. And I think that's become something that we've uh, sharpened our pencils and paintbrushes and camera lenses on to produce even more frequently. All of this comes a result of the walking. So. This is my chance to tell the anecdote of the Ganesic Rock, which is on the left. Uh, one of my first solitary walks to Marblehead for the project was to go to Steer Swamp. And there down a series of switchbacks through branches, I spied a rock that was about 10 feet off the path, the Ganesic Rock. 10 feet off the path, but no one paid it any attention because the people walking there were walking with smartphones, walking with babies in packs, walking with dogs, walking with cell phones and dogs pushing baby carriages, and not looking at what was to be seen right in front of them or near to them. We walked through every preserved open space we could find in Marblehead. And we realized that the very existence of these small pockets of open spaces was one of the reasons for densely built Marblehead's resilience as a community. And to the right of the rock itself, you see one of Susan's wonderful silk painting interpretations and visions of the rock. Walking slowly. Well, now we're moving on to our current project, the Once and Future Salt Marsh. Our clients are the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge and Woods Hole Ecosystem Center. The image within our logo is my first silk painting of a salt marsh sparrow, the canary in the marsh. It takes 26 days for a salt marsh sparrow to lay her eggs, incubate, hatch and fledge her chicks. Her nest is on the very edge of the marsh. She typically lays her eggs immediately after a spring, spring tide has passed. The eggs and chicks then have only one more spring tide to survive before they're ready to leave the nest. Her nest can float up on the high tide and settle down when the tide drops, which allows the eggs to bob up and down. But if there's a very high tide, the young chips, chicks can't escape. And there are increasingly high tides because of sea level rise. And the chicks face a terrifying danger of drowning if flooding happens too often. Salt marsh sparrows face extinction in 50 years time. Meanwhile, the photographer who went along when we went out into the salt marsh to see the salt marsh nest, I had my camera and I said, I would really like to photograph this little bird flying. 
And I saw yet another gap between science and art. I can sum up what a salt marsh sparrow looks like to you. If you can envision a baked potato flying through the air with wings, that's the way this little bird would fly about 10 feet and settle down. I have no idea how the iron bird can migrate, but it's a baked potato. Or maybe not a baked potato, a live potato. <laughs> We're working closely with scientists and staff from these two agencies. Um, on the left is Anne Giblin from the Marine Biological Lab Laboratory at Woods Hole. And the, on the right is Nancy Powell, a biologist at the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. One of the things that we love to do in these projects is to collaborate very closely with scientists. And both Anne and Nancy have provided us with invaluable scientific understanding of the effects of climate change on the Great Marsh and how scientists are working to create a much more resilient and sustainable marsh. And I also want to give a shout out to Robert Buxbaum, recently retired from Mass Audubon. Hi, Robert. <laughs> He really helped us a great deal in getting started with this project. So part of the project is looking at fiddler crabs and what's happening with the fiddler crabs as a result of climate change. And this is a silk painting in the making of fiddler crabs in the marsh. They're actually typically found much farther south in Georgia but they're moving north to Cape Ann and up to the Plum Island Marsh because the larvae I live in are warming waters. The waters are warming because of climate change. The male fiddler crabs have a distinctive, very large left claw, which they use to attract females. And they also use it to create two foot long burrows. The scientists call them ecosystem engineers. If a multitude of these crabs arrive in our marshes digging many, many burrows, they could potentially contribute to destabilizing the marsh, or they could simply help aerate the marsh, allowing marsh grasses to thrive and provide more habitat for important shore birds like egrets. One of our charters for this project on the Western Future Salt Marsh is to incorporate uh, contemporary photography, historic photography, and historic art. The Great Marsh, the Natural and Cultural Resources timeline is slated to be on a wall eight feet wide by seven high. At the bottom of it is a photograph of the Great Marsh. And I would just like to say that that was taken with the iPhone 11. It's panoramic. At print size, it's going to be 40 inches high by eight feet in width, and it's a fall scene. Above it, what might be seen as being perhaps clouds or hard to know what it might be mountains is a historic painting by Arthur Wesley Dow, who was uh, a luminary figure in American art, a native of Ipswich. And he resolved his views of the marsh, grass, water, and sky into a singular view. Uh, one of the reasons we talked about and selected this particular image is that Arthur Wesley Dow spent 10 years looking at this scene before he decided or found a way to present his view. And so we selected this painting to suggest that history is always present and always guiding the present. Well, wait a minute, Les. Talking about the present, we also wanted to say that because of COVID-19, we might well be doing, just doing an outdoor exhibit, not an indoor oh, exhibit. This is true. Yep. That's one of the great challenges. I'll go back to the slide just a minute. One of the great challenges with, with public art, all the big projects we've done, we've had them scaled, done, ready to print, and all of a sudden the dimensions of the space change. And so it's a really interesting challenge for the Once and Future Salt Marshes. We've designed it for indoors, got all the panels sized, and now it looks like it's going to be outdoors. So it's a, a great opportunity to go back to the drawing board. So I will talk to the Cape Ann Climate Coalition, which I'm a member of and have been since its very inception, which is encouraging the collaboration of many local environmental activists and organizations. And we actually have seven action groups and I'm involved with a climate arts group, which we will be holding online or a live climate festival on November 28th. 
So we want to encourage local Cape Ann artists to change their artistic lens and look at climate change as it affects them, whether it's from sea level rise to carbon sequestration or to the connections with COVID-19. And young people and children are especially invited to join us in creating a Cape Ann climate arts movement. Do you have anything else you want to add to, on this one, Susan? No, I don't think so. Okay. So we're going to wrap up here by going back to the beginning and reminding you that climate change does not respect boundaries. In fact, climate change does not respect Cape Ann. Climate change does not respect words. Climate change does not respect where you expect things to remain. When you sign out of Zoom, you think that the key will fit the door to your house, that the key will fit the door to your car. We think that our families are going to remain. We expect our cherished icons to always remain the same. We face the unsettling of cherished icons due to new impending storms. Thank you so much. Um, Les, this is Mary Jenkins. Um, I, so there, there, there are a lot of things that come up, you know, in, in thinking about and looking at the work that you've been doing. And I, I just want to start, Les, with you with a really basic question, which is what adjustments have you made as an artist in um, focusing on this work, on this, uh, on climate change? Well, the first one is really simple. It's one word, it's the word my. I've had to put the word my aside. I've had to come to the realization that it's not my work. It's something that comes out of working with this wonderful artistic collaborator that addresses a community, Cape Ann, and that brings a, a, a meaning to the urgency of realizing that the ground underneath our feet is shifting. And so Susan, you know, I mean, from my point of view, art is, um, is unique because of its freedom to pursue open-ended relationships without necessarily having a set agenda or, um, or being forced to come up with an outcome or solutions. What's your perspective on that? Well, it's really simple. I hope that the silk work hits people in the heart. I know it won't provide solutions. My goal is only to engage people, especially young people. I love teaching silk painting and using environmental issues to work with children. So that's, that's where I come from. And what about, um, I had the opportunity, I was in um, London last year when um, Olafur Olesen's retrospective um, was being done at the Tate Modern and saw his piece, which was essentially blocks of ice that were um, set out in front of the museum that were just simply melting. And one of the things that I was really intrigued by was the audience's response to that work, um, which was people were hugging the um, icicle, they were hugging the blocks of ice, they were definite, they were lingering in place. So there are, I mean, this is a movement that's been um, going on for some time. There are, any num there are a number of artists working on climate change issues in mm -hmm. Gloucester. Um, and worldwide. So what, is, what are some of the, Susan, what are some of the artists that you admire? The artist who has really been my artist mentor for this work on climate change is a, a batik artist called Mary Edna Fraser. And she collaborates with a scientist called Oren Piltney. And they, she's produced the most amazing, enormous scale batiks in silk of mostly of the marshes. She's, she comes from South Carolina. Um, and so it's the marshes of South Carolina. And I've actually gone to her home in James Island, near Charleston, mm -hmm. and studied with her for a couple of 
a couple of days, which was wonderful. And I took classes with her at the Silk Painting International Fest Festival two years ago. Mm -hmm. For me, she's, she's, she's the one I really look up to and I'm so grateful for her friendship. Mm -hmm. So that's been a way of increasing your skills too. Oh yes, for sure. The production of your own work and then um, being able to focus it, yeah. the work on the topic in hand. So um, is a, is, if you were to kind of be talking to an artist who might be interested in getting involved in this work, what would you say that they need to do? This is a question for both of you. What, what, how would they make a start? The way I started at the very beginning in about 2013 was to try and learn as much as I could. And I went to seminars and lectures and read as much as I possibly could. My husband was working for Kleinfelder and they did the climate change plan actually for, for Gloucester. So I met some of his colleagues within the climate group and talk to them and ask them as many questions as I possibly could. So I think I would suggest that you learn the topic. So um, Les, do you have a perspective about that? Do you wanna? Yeah, a quick one. Um, number one, because the way I started with Susan, say no to something for a long time so that you can really get clear about what the yes is that it's asking for you to speak to, all right? Mm -hmm. Then, uh, start to realize that there's going to be a whole new language that you have to learn of behavior. Uh, as I'm fond of saying, I never knew how to spell the word grant until I met Susan. And um, I can at least spell it with a lowercase in knowing what the steps are that are required, because um, there are a lot of requirements in this. I mean, I, I, I totally applaud individual artists and, and the starts that they make. This is a different start, that, that, and because of the stakes are so high, I'm really wishing that the many more artists would be working together. So find a find no and then find a yes. Okay, and then, I mean, obviously we're in the most extraordinary situation right now. So how, what do you think is most urgent um, now in terms of climate change issues and how is this affecting your thinking going forward? Well, either, I think, either one of you. Excuse yeah, 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 it's, um, <coughs> it's why I think we chose and why I've, shows that image of the fisherman at the wheel being lifted off the base. Mm -hmm. That it's the, the urgency in the situation is that our very cherished cultural icons that we would not even think of changing are at risk or at need to be at risk or need to be adjusted or to be grieved over and knowing that we're gonna lose them, whatever it might be, whether it's, and for that, that I think that's the current situation. Mm -hmm. that it's, there's a grieving that needs to come into the picture of, and an awareness of those icons. Susan, what do you what do you have a perspective on this? Well, one of the the things that I'm particularly interested in right now in the connections between COVID nineteen and climate change is the whole concept of zo zoonotic disease when infectious diseases move from people to animals because of climate change because the animal habitat is being lost from fires or droughts or human development so that the animals are put into greater proximity to one another and those vulnerable to disease get the disease from the new animals that they've been introduced to and then they in turn transmit it to people. Um, this was the cause of Ebola as well as possibly COVID-19. So I'm really interested in pursuing this whole connection with zoonotic diseases and zoonoses, zoonosis, which is the germs from the other animals. And I'm, I'm already thinking, how could I put that into a silk painting? Okay. And then um, we're going to turn this over for your questions. If you have questions, please enter them in chat. I'm going to start sort of at the top here. And uh, apologies in advance if I don't pronounce your name properly. Um, so Steve uh, Previsa, Previsa. Um, he asked the question about the purpose of this, of the group. Um, is it general inspiration for artists or is there a goal or some particular group action that um, people are thinking about taking around um, 
artists and climate change on KPAN? I would like to answer that because um, I'm hoping that artists who've been watching this presentation will be interested in looking at the Cape Ann Climate Coalition. You can find out more about us on Town Green 2025's website. It's towngreen2025.org. And we actually have seven action groups and the one for artists is the action group with climate called Climate Arts. And I'm leading this in, in collaboration with Rebecca Reynolds and Axel Magnuson. So it would be wonderful if people became more interested in this group. You can also find us on Facebook under Cape Ann Climate Coalition. And Susan, you're planning um, a festival later on this year. Well, we hope, we hope so. It's in uh, conjunction with Fair Saturday on November 28th. We're hoping to have a climate festival, but I, at this point, we just can't say what kind of festival it's going to be or whether it's even happening in 2020. Yes, it's extraordinary. I'm watching a lot of artists adapt um, the way they're working. So to use mediums like this one um, to be able to express their creativity and um, it's been an extraordinary outpouring. Um, Dave, Diana Finch makes the um, point that overpopulation also contributes to this, um, to this, to the issues we're dealing with today in terms of climate change. Mm. I want to make mention of that. And then um, Alison Anholt White says that um, she wanted to point out that there's an elephant in the room um, um, that. The climate change issues of the last 50 years, the fossil fuel industry and a political system that facilitates some um, environmental degradation and pollution. Um, so what, how have you thought about addressing the original causes, you know, the, um, the issues of, around destruction of the planet? Is that, are you really focusing on issues directly concerning Cape Ann and the you know um the more local issues how does that sort of dovetail with larger global issues that people um that people are aware of i think it's really hard for artists to tackle head-on such enormous issues it's it's much more simple and straightforward to take slices of an issue and in our case we've taken the slice of the coastal landscape it's, it makes it more doable, basically. And I, but I, you know, I totally understand that it's part of a much, much larger issue. Okay. And um, you're both visual artists, but um, I, I do want to say, because somebody's asked a question about this, that, that this work is applicable to artists of all disciplines, um, writers, poets, you, you name it, dancers, you name it. I mean, you can see artists across the world who focusing on this work actually run the gamut in terms of the discipline they're bringing forward and that makes it so um incredibly dynamic i mean i i went to see quarry dance at window um done by windover one of the uh, quarries um by the manship um artist residency and was very struck by their not only that they use the landscape to enhance what they were doing, but it made you think about the landscape quite differently as an audience member. And that juxtaposition, I think, is so interesting. So, um, uh, so let's see. Um, uh, one question is the coalition, the Cape Ann um, Climate Coalition, um, we're being asked whether or not it, there's, there is a Gloucester branch of the meeting or do all the meetings take place in Beverly? Oh no, the meetings don't play, take place in, in Beverly. Um, they typically take, take place in Gloucester. Okay, so, um, and how often do the meetings take place? How do you find out information about the meetings? Where do you get The way to find out information is to go on the Facebook page of Cape Ann Climate Coalition. Mm -hmm. um, and the Town Green website. We have been having meetings, very large meetings, um, every two months, but it's now changed with COVID-19. And I guess we will have the next meeting at the end of May or early June, and it'll be through Zoom. Mm -hmm. So that will, and I presume there'll be some um, 
there'll be information given there about sort of what next steps are likely to look like for the coalition and also this sort of strand of um, how artists can get involved if they want to take action. Yes. Or, um, and okay. this, this whole presentation will be available to view on the Facebook page of the Cape Ann Climate Coalition, which also has a, a number of other videos. It's been wonderfully curated by Lisa Smith. Okay, so the hope is, um, as far as I understand it, the hope is that the presentation um, will be able to be used in other forums as well and by other um, organizations, artists, you know, art based organizations as well as um, climate organizations. Um, so, what um, I just want to go back to something, you know, about, um, you know, the ways you balance your work practice against uh, the um, amount of research you do and how much time um, you spend on the research aspects of it. Is that you know, would you describe your work practice a little bit in terms of how you, are you doing other work as, or is it primarily focused on climate change? How does this, how does that hang together for you at the minute, either one of you? Liz, do you want to talk to this? I, I guess first there's fierce arguments come into the picture. <laughs> and, and yang of, um, I mean, so there's the deep science, which, you know, I kind of am on the periphery of it's like being on a lazy Susan that's going around and you get, in, get into a slice of it that Susan is working and gnawing her way through and refining. Um, the, the arguments come in, come into uh, the, of, of staying on focus of producing something that's going to be of effect and relates to the public. Um, history is a good example of this. With the salt marshes, I dove into hundreds, troves of old pictures, troves of old stories. And we end up with that one background by Arthur Wesley Dow because it distills. So a lot of our work practice is a, a distillation is the word that I would use. Okay. Um, and yeah, there, there are, there are uh, other projects, you know, that we, we've put a lot of time into the, the granting process. We've had wonderful help from the nonprofits and friends that have done tremendous amount of legwork as it is with all of these you know as you mentioned this seeing the the exhibition in europe of the ice melting yes well somewhere there needed to be the molds to make the ice or somewhere the water needed to be gathered right and it's in the gathering of the water many times that the pricing structure kind of becomes passion <laughs> okay look and susan's laughing you know when, when we did the national park service project that big project on uh, the, the wall in salem we thought we'd found the, the briar patch or the golden egg because we learned every national park had its own budget and we were laying out we were going to do a template to go from place to place to place and what we found is that with all the projects we found a, a hero or an advocate within the organization itself um, unfortunately we were doing this in 2015 right before the election and with the election all of the templating went away and we needed to kind of scratch and start over again mm -hmm. I think it's a distillation. So it also takes more, enormous amounts of perseverance. Um, yeah. Susan and I were actually talking this morning and, and one of the things that strikes me is that, you know, the tendency is to say, well, you know, the, the, first of all, the, this, this as an area um, is so in, interconnected. There are so many layers to it, you know, um, and the tendency is to say, wait a minute, it's about this, it's not about that. Um, it's about, it's about, um, edu it's about education, um, it's about poverty, it's about um, food, you know, it touches on food security. The interconnected nature of climate change and that dynamic and the way that it lines up with how we live, what our expectations can be, what our hopes and wishes are, seem to me to be, you know, not one thing or the other. How do you, um, how do you see that um, in terms of sort of making choices about the way you're working? Susan. It's often serendipity, Mary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not necessarily one thing following another. It's... Yeah, actually, so here's, here's, here's how it works. Because it's not like there's, it's not, it's not a, not a solution or a cookbook of step one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. um, 
we were at the, it was the, was the Great Marsh Coalition Symposium 2017, Susan? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were at the Great Marsh Coalition 2017, and it was at Woodman's in Essex. Mm -hmm. And it ran from nine to 12. And presenters had 15 minutes to talk. And within that 15 minutes, I'll be generous and say that all, all, almost all of the presenters packed in an hour's worth of information at machine gun speed of talking, mm -hmm. right? And Susan got up to talk and she talked for 10 minutes. And that created such a breathing space in the audience. People came up, it was lunch after that, they commented to her and actually it was from that moment that the Parker River, I'm playing a hunch here, Susan, the Parker River once in future salt marsh project mm -hmm. had the gist of an idea. So sometimes it's in between the cracks of what an agenda might be or what a presentation might be that the possibility for the project emerges. Right. There and lots the opportunity. Yes. But yeah. you, you sort of have to have to be out there. I was giving this lecture on a 10 minute talk, an illustrated talk on the landscapes of the Great Marsh. And I was just in the lunch line and, and Giblin from Woods Hole Laboratory came up to me and said, would you be interested in doing an exhibit? Right. And that's how it all started. Right. So um, it often happens like that. Yeah. I just want to, um, I, I think it can be both. Um, it can both be um, uh, in a more organic way of being able to work and make connections, but it can also be um, the more that people are connected, the, spe the speed with which ideas can be shared escalates. Um, and it, it goes from a, sort of being a, um, a field, you know, a field of kind of interesting ideas percolating into being a substantial movement. Um, just want to um, if you've got a pen and paper handy, I've got um, a, an email that you can, um, you can send an email to um, the Cape Ann Climate Coalition um, to request more information about meetings and what have you. And that is CA Climate Coalition, all one word, at gmail.com. That's CA Climate Coalition at gmail.com. So um, let's see, what other questions have come up here? So, um, Axel Magnuson says, much art isn't so directly um, didactic, message driven. How can artists that focus on climate change with having, um, uh, focus on climate change without having to change their medium or be part of a formal exhibit? How can they, how, so how do, how do you adapt the work? Well, one of the chief features of our work has been to print to lightweight material. Uh, either a fabric or actually printing silk on silk. And that's allowed us to exhibit in less formal exhibition spaces, both inside and outside. Mm -hmm. And that's important because it means shipping costs are minimal. It means rolling it up and putting it in the car much of the time. Um, and, so that, and, and it can, it, again, it can be moved from one spot to another. The Clamola quarry dance silk that Susan produced traveled from Cape Ann to Marblehead back to Lanesville and then to Lee, New Hampshire, where it was placed around a pond. And people in attendance at the event thought, A, that the art had been commissioned for it, so it was speaking to them, or thought that it had been there for two or three years, mm -hmm. that it fit in situ. So um, I think that, you know, and, and it's not requiring to use the medium that we've got, it's the tactic of um, how can this art be placed in different circumstances and mm -hmm. still speak. And I think that that's one of our motivating forces. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things I, um, I also think about is uh, the audience that you put this work in front of, because on the one hand, you've got people who don't believe that climate change is an issue at all. I mean, it runs the spectrum from that to people who are, who are very strong advocates and think it all has to be done right now, um, that we need to take action right now. And you've been and You've been involved in this conversation now for seven years among you, and you've managed to um, you've managed to kind of produce this sort of series of works. How would you how do you how do you deal with the frustration of the pace in with which the, your own work is able to be produced and and put out there? Are you saying that the, the climate change work that we're doing? Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. I mean, with the the work has been out. 
for the public. They, they're all public art exhibits. So you never know who's going to be showing up when the Parker River work is going to be out on the wildlife, wildlife refuge. It might be seen by people who just came there to go kayaking or to go bird watching. And they may or may not believe in, in the whole climate crisis, but you just hope that they'll take something from it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a modest goal. I think the modest goal is to say, yeah, we would like in an audience of so many, we would like someone to take slight note of or to notice an aspect. The, the, at the National Park Service exhibit where we had the climate change does not mm -hmm. respect boundaries in four languages. Uh, Susan was in England. I was there on Halloween, which is the big day where everyone goes to the bathroom in Salem. And that's what the visitor center is for. Long lines out the door, right? And I was there to watch. Are people looking? What are they doing? And some people were looking. Mm -hmm. And there was this wonderful woman from Haiti, somewhere in the Caribbean, wonderfully dressed. She's looking and all of a sudden she looks down and she sees the line in French. And she, I'm seeing that, I can see that she's translating. She's now that's her way into the exhibit. It, well, that was about 15 seconds. It's about 30 seconds of my recounting it. Does she remember more than that moment? At least there is that moment of connection. Mm -hmm. It's a necklace of little tiny moments of connections that, that, that are the modest goals, I think, of, of the kind of public art that we're doing. Okay. So I think um, we are out of time here already. Um, I'm going to close this by saying that if you are an artist who's listening in today, um, one of the questions you could ask yourself is, in what, what way does my, the way I work, the work I'm producing apply in this um, framework? And um, do I, am I interested in having a conversation about what that would look like? You know, um, and I'm sure that Les and um, Susan will be, uh, as they're part of the Cape Ann Co um, Climate Coalition in any case, that will be part of the conversation that begins to happen as, they, as decisions are made about how to do this festival um, coming up in November. So I just want to thank um, Les and Susan. I have been involved in the most, I've learned a lot just by being in conversation with them over the last few weeks. Um, you are welcome to stay. We're going to hang out for a little bit and we will unmute the people that are left so you, you can um, participate if you want to. We're going to stay with this for a, about another 10 minutes or so and then we're going to, we're going to all take off. But um, just, in, just in case anybody wants to sort of say anything out loud at this point about you know either the work they're doing their specific concerns whatever whatever it is that's sort of on your mind or or anything you'd like to say to um to les or susan at this point marcia white hi hi um, i'm marcia hart and i work also with the uh, climate coalition in gloucester mm -hmm. and i rely on artists to um sort of a, uh, I know not all artists like to be involved in social issues, but I appreciate ones who are or who just challenge the realities that um, are sort of foist upon us to be more like sheep and more normal and to uh, comply. And um, with climate change, there are so many ways that COVID is um, illuminating the social problems that we have, mm -hmm. um, the injustice, the inequities, climate change, um, uh, the effect of the economy on the economy, the uh, terrible time that people are having uh, whose incomes have been cut short, and what will we be left with when uh, this is over. So I'm wondering uh, what artists feel um, who are inclined to um, make more social statements or to deal more directly with um, climate change and perhaps the connection between COVID and climate change. What could, uh, what, what could you possibly do? So Les, um, you um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So I want to bring it back. 
the, one of the frank disagreements with Susan and I is this, this issue of what to do. And Susan's a great planner. Right? I'm a guy with dirt under my feet. And I look around Cape Ann, having lived here for almost 50 years. And I realize, as, as Mary said, there's this great intertwining of events and wishes and agendas. And you've just said it very eloquently, Marsha, at a level of social justice and what's happening in the United States. Right? But what I want to put forth is that if, in order to be more effective, we need to challenge ourselves more directly, energetically. And the image of the fisherman at the wheel being lifted is that if I were to leave this meeting and go down to Gloucester and put a crane next to that statue and make a motion as if I was lifting it, the citizenry of Gloucester would, would tear me to shreds. So local awareness through the kind of art that we're doing and being attuned to it, it's really important to me. And there's 300 years of local history before that icon of Gloucester gets created. And just as you are mentioning questions at a, at, a, at, a, at a social and national level that affect all of us. The fact is, the greatest pandemic that we suffer is the pandemic of forgetfulness and forgetting that we forget and forgetting that there was a huge effort to get the boulevard cleared. People were moved. <coughs> Houses were sold out from underneath them in order for the space to be created. And I know this is a tiny little event, but we have to take all these tiny little events and allow them to come together in the face of COVID-19, in the face of climate change. For me, the elephant in the room is not fossil fuel. We were, Allison was referring to that earlier. It's that we forget. We forget all of the, all the things that have gone before. I gave a talk yesterday on the 1918 pandemic on KPN. We've forgotten it all. If it wasn't for the women, if it wasn't for the nurses coming in from Canada, our parents wouldn't have made it through. Okay? So the, the problem is not the fear of what's coming, the fear of continuing to forget. And that's where I think art, art can come in and art can hold. You know, I gave, the, there, there was a, um, a nursery rhyme in 1918. I had a little bird and her name was Inza. I opened the window and influenza. So we've got all of our windows open <laughs> for all of the same forgetful, yeah, and all of the issues. And you're eloquent in what you say, I get it. But we need to bring our eloquence from saying over there, over there, to bring it back here. So why we did, when we started the climate change project at the MPS, and Susan was showing me websites from climate change in Europe and England, I'm saying, this is great, but they're all single language. You know, the, 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 they're not being translated into German or into French or Italian. So um, okay. a couple of things I want to say yeah. is that, um, so what, one of the things that steps out immediately is Leslie's and Susan's passion for what it is they're doing. And um, for artists, um, artists have multiple responsibilities. I mean, in terms of, and I think actually being involved in, work that atta is attached to a movement is a choice. Um, and um, there are obvious considerations to take into account, whether or not you're interested in working collaboratively, whether or not you have the time, the resources to be able to, or can find the resources to be able to focus on the work. Where it happens and where artwork is um, created, I've, I've experienced it as being incredibly dynamic and um, it certainly takes an audience to places that they that are unexpected, um, oftentimes. So um, let's um, let's see whether or not anyone else has a comment that they'd like to make. Just put your hands up, and we can sort of unmute you. Okay, got it. Susan and Les, I really congratulate you on a wonderful production, and I didn't want to in any way belittle the work you've done because I think it's really important and. Um, I hear what you're saying about staying local and very often that has a influence on other people that you know you can't get by shouting from the rooftop so to speak I think a little at a time it's like a raw shash thing where it just keeps growing and I think that's wonderful however what I was really behind my question about the fossil fuel industry and the political landscape and I really uh, like what Marsha Hart said about all of that you know, when all this is over, will we just forget? And I think Les is totally right. Forgetfulness is a big problem.
but there are malign political forces at work. And I'm just trying to sort of bridge the gap between dealing with things at a very local level and somehow bringing these things to the attention of those companies. And maybe there are even local companies that are um, not operating in the best possible ways for our, for our environment that could be um, shown or you could find some way to exhibit or other artists could find some way to exhibit to these people because otherwise I feel there's a risk that we're preaching to the choir that we are the people in this room are all in complete agreement with you about the problems but there's a whole swath of people out there and maybe even in our geographical area that are not but you know I've been working with trying to get people to compost and you know the number is stuck at 20% of the town of Manchester which is you know surprising you would think everybody would want to compost it's a small thing you think they'd want to do it but they don't there are big obstacles so I'm just wondering how the means by which you can get these messages further afield to possibly people that where it would really count and where it really could make it more of a a global or a nationwide difference question? I think this is a really important question, Alison. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Um, I think that the way it works is through community activism, through, the, through acting through the Cape Ann Climate Coalition or through your sustainability committee in in Manchester, I think that's th those are the only ways. I know that there are people at the Cape Ann Climate Coalition who are working with um, on the whole issue of Chase and other banks uh, uh, supporting the fossil fuel industry, and that you know the, the, there's a, there's many um, there's a lot of activism around that. And I do believe that if you combine activism, well, I don't know about combining activism with arts per se, but I think that for me, the art and the activism are very important parts, parts of the whole. And Les, Les um, we have, you know, we have a different approach to it. He, see, he sees it more from a historical and philosophical approach than community activism. But there's many ways to slice this. Yeah, yes, I, I agree with that. I, I don't think it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. I really think it, you know, things come together. Um, so, you know, and in debate, sometimes what we do is we take a position and say, yes, but it's only about this. And I think that, you know, what we need to do is could do a continual sweep of okay what's going on what's the most appropriate thing um the question that you raised about how to take an audience or take people from a, 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 a kind of lethargic response into taking action themselves is a really interesting one and i think i've seen again and again that the arts are a great way to kind of translate that um i think i also think it's about showing people actually how to you know showing people again and again we think that once or twice is enough when we're showing people something but actually it's not um we we need to it needs to be it needs we, it this is a process change is a process as we all know um and lots of people now are waving their hands we really have time for one more question so i'm going to take stephen bates well, thank you for that i want to congratulate both uh um most lessons to fantastic, this was a fantastic presentation. So calm in your responses and so well prepared. Uh, I am the uh, current teacher at the 10 Pound Studio, uh, silk painting, and one of the uh, topics that we often speak about, Susan, is uh, that real power of art in communicating, you've been using the term communication quite a lot today, uh, is to gently help people to see the truth uh, mm -hmm. because there's an element of beauty that is always a factor in art. Uh, and um, as a result, you have people like Goya and Ben Sean in particular who uh, uh, use uh, topics that are very tough to face 
and yet people will stare at the uh, uh, firing squad of Goya. Mm -hmm. Goya's paint of the firing squad. They'll just stare at it with uh, tremendous willingness to watch and hear the sound of it. Whereas if you see this, a photograph of that in the newspaper, you might turn away. And so I encourage artists to recognize their power to uh, create um, the kind of work as, as painters, as photographers, performers, musicians, and so on, that really fundamentally is allowing people to look. And it's a paradox of the subject of beauty it's a terrible beauty that can be used to get people's attention. And we can go on for on, on and on about this. Look at, uh, at, at opera, for example. Anyway, yeah. thank you very much for your beautiful work and uh, extremely well presented today. Thank you. So someone here has pointed out that, you know, actually, if you Google artists and climate change, there are pages of um, of, in, of articles and information about actually what's going on, um, what their focus is, what they're doing, um, how this work is being viewed or reviewed. Um, you know, this is a, uh, Susan and Les are working locally on some of the issues, very specific to KPAN, very important actually to the community as it, as it opens up conversations around how to deal with rising seas and how to deal with sustaining the natural environment in which you, you live. So um, I want to thank you for showing up today. I hope this conversation that many of the people who participated today will continue actually in this conversation. And if you haven't been involved in it, we'll actually get involved in some, you can always bow out. You can always say, mm, that's as far as I go. And that's okay. But you can always, conversations never hurt anyone. And that's really where it starts, I think. And that's what's been so extraordinary about the conversation um, that Les and Susan have been having um, for the past seven years together, um, which I think is uh, an extraordinary and, and deep conversation, evidently. Um, so I wish you well, stay well, stay healthy. Um, and as they say, we'll get through this. Um, last yesterday, I saw an adaptation of the um, little rhyme that we all know, Good Night Moon. And it was Good Night Moon, Good Night Zoom, Good Night Sense of Impending Doom. So let's see what we can all do to kind of change that around. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.